I just want to welcome you to our family church day today. Um, if you're new to us, and even if you're not new, please take a look at our Connect cards. Uh, just a way for us to get to know you a little bit better. We have prayer request needs on this list. You can fill it out. And when the offering plate comes around, you can put it in that basket, or you can go back out to the welcome desk, and I think there's a gift there for our new bees to our family. Uh, the other thing we like to do um, at Milton Bible Church is contributions, and contributions are something that's a bit of an encouragement uh, to our church body. It can be sharing a testimony, a verse, uh, something that's uplifting that you'd like to share, and it's a minute to win it type of theme. Uh, so if you think that's something for you today, just come over and I'm sitting over here. Um, you can just chat with me about it and we can um, see if it's appropriate. Uh, I'd like to open in um, just a verse that um, I've saved and it's a little bit about renewed strength and it's from Isaiah 40, verse 31. Um, the whole verse is, verse, or the whole chapter of Isaiah 40 is great, but I just narrowed it down to this one. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. You know, a lot of this is you think about hoping in the Lord gives us assurance, and that produces renewed strength, which is always trialing, uh, very trying in, in, testy, in testy times. But it gives us the assurance that we have that renewed strength in our Lord. I just thought I'd share that with you. And that weight is always, that weight and that renewed strength is always so, we're always so impatient. Um, but the, the weight is good because he, um, he knows that it will change us and it will strengthen us as we wait. So i just like to continue in worship um, and let our, uh, just the presence of the Lord come on into the room. Uh, so as, just as the offering um, baskets go around, I'll make a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, uh, just the VBS, a really quick shout out to our VBS camp that's happening uh, mid-July. The dates are escaping me, but it's on our website. Uh, they're actually going through and um, asking for practical assistance. So if you see a board out in the lobby and it has little cards like this, you can actually grab the card and this is something that I'm hoping that I won't eat before it gets to camp, but it's um, 10 family-sized animal cracker packages. So they have a, a list of things. So if you feel that to be uh, able to help them practically, you can just take one of these cards and then contribute and leave them at a desk out there. Right, Sonia? Okay, thank you. Um, next one is tomorrow, June 24th, in the humidity, but I think it's going to break, um, we are starting our Move More Milton, um, but it's the MBC style. It's happening at the Milton Sports Complex, which is um, on Santa Maria Boulevard, in the, uh, just meet at the parking lot near the gazebo in the back. Details are there. Um, Matt Timpson's in charge of this, but he's looking for other leaders that may want to uh, join in. But it's a time where you can uh, come out and walk a 2.5 kilometer loop, um, and there might be some joggers in the, in the crowd as well. So you can walk or run as little as you wish, but it's a great time just to get out, get some fresh air, and enjoy some amazing conversation with some Milton Bible Church friends. Uh, this is our last Sunday for two services until September. So next Saturday, Saturday, Sunday. See, there's always something I do. Uh, next Sunday, we are going to one service. So 10 a.m., mark your calendars, um, set your alarm clock, whatever you need to do. But we're going to one service for the summer, just as we get into holidays and people um, doing a little bit more traveling and gives our leadership and our teams a little bit of a break from doing the two uh, service um, uh, components every Sunday. So that's that. Um, what else did I miss? Usually there's something. Oh, last one. Uh, Summer Connect. So the prayer course, part two, and that's starting July 3rd, and I believe there's six Wednesdays that they're working through a course. Um, and it's a Bible-based study, of course, but it's um, talking about themes and questions around unanswered prayer, which is very uh, common that we always think we are, you know, we're not getting prayer right away, but it helps to deepen in your prayer life. So if you're interested in that, uh, all the information is on our website, so you can register online. And I think that's all I have. Um, I'd like to just take a time just to pray for the kids um, before they go to their ministries. So let's take a time to pray for them. 
Uh, Lord, we just lift up our children as they uh, leave and go and enjoy your, um, your teachings and that they learn the love of Jesus even more, and then they can bring that love of Jesus to their friends and family. We just ask that you watch over our teachers and all of our um, volunteers that are um, just diving into our children and encouraging them in this amazing way. We ask you bless them, their time t- together. In your name, amen. All right. So our kids can uh, start rushing out. I'm going to invite Pastor Mark up, but just say hi to your neighbor. And I thought about something this morning. Um, I don't usually talk about sports, but how about that renewed strength with those Oilers, right? Like, it's pretty exciting. So what's going to happen tomorrow? All right. Well, good morning, church family. It's great to be with you today. And um, just before we get into it, I want to mention Pastor Jim is over this morning preaching at another church in town, Southside. And so uh, they invited him to come and preach there. And I only mention that because it uh, ties in to Christina's testimony even. That was our old building and facility. And I think it's just a really special and cool opportunity for Pastor Jim, who had a lot to do with that building being a church, to be invited back to share there this morning. So why don't we just take a minute to pray uh, for Jim, as he may even be speaking right at this moment. Lord Jesus, We thank you for uh, Pastor Jim, and we thank you for Mary, and Lord, we thank you for the many amazing years of ministry at 200 Main Street, on Main Street in Milton, Lord. Um, We thank you, Lord, for Jim and Mary's hand in the ministry that happened in that location over those many years. God, we pray blessing on Jim this morning as he shares your word at Southside, and we thank you for our friends at Southside and the amazing gospel ministry that they have there. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, well, we are in week four of First Thessalonians. Uh, we started weeks one and two looking at themes of revival and awakening in chapters one and two. We talked about being missionaries, that's Aries, on mission to bring revival and awakening to our region. And then on week three, we looked at the theme of holiness that comes out in chapters three and a bit of chapters four, and the call to holiness um, as it's balanced with living in the grace that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. Well, this morning, as I was preparing uh, for the message from 1 Thessalonians 4 and a little bit of chapter 5, um, my mind was brought back to two weeks ago in this very room where we had a celebrational life service for a longtime member of Milton Bible Church, Herb Bailey. Uh, Herb was 91 years old when he passed away. Uh, He started here at this church about 15 years ago as a young man in his 70s, you know, helped co-found our Food for Life ministry um, that Carolyn, who's meeting our leading now uh, this morning, now leads the Food for Life ministry. Um, But Herb was a dear saint. He was a dear saint. And one of the things that struck me about the gathering for his celebrational life was the testimonies that came from people who knew him about just um, how, how hope-filled and how he always pointed to Jesus. He always pointed to doing things for the kingdom. His grandchildren came up and his children came up and they honored him and shared about um, just how amazing their dad was, their grandfather was, and that they knew that he was with Jesus. And indeed, the sense was that we were not two Sundays ago at a funeral. And I love that we no longer really, we're not calling things funerals as much. Do you know what the root of the word funeral is? The root word of funeral, it comes from Latin. It means dead body. It means go to see the dead body. And that's not what we did two weeks ago. In fact, there was no body in the room two weeks ago. We came to celebrate Herb's life. And we celebrated not only his life and his legacy that he lived, but we celebrated the life that he still has because Herb had placed his faith in Jesus Christ and his hope was in heaven. He didn't pass from life to death, but he passed from life to life. Hope, hope. Herb had a hope. He had a hope in Jesus that took him from this life to the next life. What about you? Do you ever take the time to think about life's big questions? Do you ever take the time to think about some of the existential questions? Why am I here? What is the meaning of life? What happens after we die? What is the nature of reality? Is there a God? Does God care about me if he exists? 
This morning, I want to invite you to open up your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 13. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 13. I won't have any slides with these passages on, so if you have a Bible, be that physical or digital, or if you need one at the back, go ahead and grab one right now. But as you're turning there, I want to give you this sentence that I think frames what we're going to be looking at today. The sentence is this, Christ's second coming is your first hope. Christ's second coming is your first hope. That word hope, it's an interesting one. There's a lot of things that we hope for in life. What I find fascinating is that we as humans, we often put these big existential questions aside. Why am I here? Why does anything exist at all? Is there a God? All these things. We put those things aside. It's like I can't think about those big ones because I've got my daily grind in front of me. I have exams to write. I've got deadlines at work. I have kids under five who are clung to me 24-7 every day, and that's all I have time to think of. I have retirement to save for. I have experiences to chase after and experience. So we make these immediate things, the things that are right in front of us, the objects of our hope. I hope to do well on my exam. I hope to finish school. I hope that I can get a good job. I hope maybe I can get a promotion at work. I hope to raise my kids to be well-adjusted people who contribute to society and enrich my life somehow. I hope to have enough in retirement to kick my feet up at 60 or 65 or whatever and enjoy the rest of my life. I hope to experience everything I ever wanted to. We make all these little hopes the objects of our attention and we make those the things that are what life's all about. And the little hopes distract us from many of life's big questions, from the ultimate questions of meaning. Why am I here? Where do I go when I die? Is there a God? Does he care? These little hopes, it's kind of like we can win the small battles on the little hopes, but we forget that we're in a bigger war. And it's fine and dandy if you win at your education, but just because you hope and aspire to something in your life and even achieve it, it doesn't mean you're going to win the war. Again, as we look at 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 today, I want you to hear this. Christ's second coming is your first hope. Christ's second coming is your first hope. Let's read from chapter 4. We're going to read from verses 13 and 14 to start. It says this, Finally then, brothers and sisters, we... Oh, I'm in the wrong spot. It says this, the coming of the Lord, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do when we have, who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Today we're going to be looking at three encouraging truths about Jesus' second coming. And the first one is this, we have a hope that no one else has. We as Christians have a hope that no one else has. Paul says you don't have to grieve about those who've passed away, Thessalonians. You don't have to grieve about those who've died because you have a different hope than everyone else, is what Paul's saying in these first two verses. You have a different hope that looks different from everyone else in the world. This is, we're talking about big picture hope here. Hope for the future, hope for the next life. Have you ever thought about maybe the major religions or belief systems and just how much uncertainty some of these world religions, belief systems offer? Did you know that 80% of people here on earth are either Christian, Muslim, non-religious, atheist, Hindu, or Buddhist? 80% of people on planet earth adhere to one of these belief systems. And if you add in a few other religions, maybe tribal religions, Sikhism, Judaism, you get to over 90% of all people believe or fall into one of these eight or nine belief systems. Have you ever examined some of the other major religions to see where they place their hope? I was looking at a few of them, and we're not going to go through every single one today, but I was looking at the secular, agnostic, non-religious one. I'm told there are over 1.2 billion people on planet Earth who consider themselves secular, non-religious, atheist, or agnostic. If you don't believe in God or an afterlife, or if you're unsure about it, think about how much uncertainty that way of belief puts on your heart when you do get around to those big questions. Like if you believe the material world is all there is, 
you have to ask questions like, what came before the start of the universe? And there's no answer to that question. What's on the other side of the expanding universe wall? Well, there's theories, but we can't test that one. If life can emerge easily around a planet or a star, why isn't the universe teeming with life, like Star Trek or something? It's something called the Drake Equation. Someone who wasn't even a Christian thought of that over 70 years ago and said, wait a second, if it only takes a billion years for life to emerge and it's common, and this universe is 13, 14 billion years old according to um, secular kind of scientific measurements, they said, well, why hasn't life emerged in the first couple billions of the universe and why isn't exponentially life everywhere like Star Trek? What's going on here? And what do you ultimately have to hope for in life when you sit in an atheistic, agnostic, secular place. It's just the stuff that you make important to you. How do you know you've picked the right things to invest your time and energy into? And how do you know those things are even worthy and good and hope-filled? And what absolute truth undergirds the decisions in your life? So much uncertainty. There's this uh, mathematician, his name was Blaise Pascal. He was a Christian, he said it well, he said, um, he said, listen, he said, imagine I'm a Christian, which he was, and you're an atheist. He said, if I die and I'm wrong about God, you and I will have the same fate. We'll just be gone and that's it. We cease to exist. He said, but if you die and you're wrong about God, there'll be an eternal weight to that decision. So what do you have to lose by believing in God? What do you have to lose, um, why, sorry, what do you have to lose by believing in God? everything. Nothing, sorry, nothing. I got those backwards. <laughs> Listen, I don't have a lot of humor in this message, so it's good I messed up so everyone can laugh, okay? I'm very infallible. What do you have to lose by not believing in God? Everything. Blaze also said he believed there's a God-shaped hole in every human's heart that can only be filled by God. Most of you may be familiar by the atheist Richard Dawkins. About 20 years ago, he wrote a book called The God Delusion. He was known as one of the four horsemen of the atheist apocalypse or something like that. But there were these guys, and they were people called them evangelical atheists because not only did they not believe in God, but they were going to tell society why they shouldn't believe in God. And it's, it's interesting what's happened to many, some of these people. But Richard Dawkins is one, for example. Um, he, he just came out a few months ago and he said, you know what? He said, I actually call myself a cultural Christian now. People are like, what? You're the God delusion guy. What do you mean you're a cultural Christian? And he said, well, I still don't really believe in God. I think that's craziness. But he said, but I see the good that religion and especially Christianity has for society. And I don't want to see that go away. So he said, I'm a cultural Christian. The atheist, Richard Dawkins, one of the, those other horsemen of the apocalypse, he chased, he's chasing the Buddhist path now, and he's on that route. There was a lady um, who wasn't formally part of it, but her name, uh, I didn't write it down, Alia, anyone? Anyone know this? Anyhow, she's a lady who grew up in a, a Muslim country. She was persecuted. She was uh, um, um, under oppressive forces, let's say, in a very radical Muslim nation, escaped it to Europe, became um, a secular uh, doctorate, and rejected, you know, any type of religion or whatever. But she came around in the last two years, and she's gone public and said, you know what, I tried, uh, she said, I, I went down this path. She said, I, I um, but I started to discover like a loneliness and a depression in life. And she said, I just couldn't find my way out of it. I was self-medicating with alcohol and stuff. And she said, I went to psychologists and I went to counselors to help me. Um, and she said, and it was okay. It was, I'm not rejecting it. She said, but the only thing where I could ultimately find meaning was in a faith in Jesus Christ. She said, that's made all the difference. And she's not radical evangelical. She said, I'm not saying this is for everyone. She said, but for me, this is the only thing that has given me meaning in my life. There's a God-shaped hole in every human's heart that only can be filled by the hope of God. What about some other belief systems? We won't go through all of them, but what about maybe Islam or, or the Muslim faith? About 1.9 people on planet Earth call themselves Muslim. We have many, many of us have Muslim neighbors um, in Milton, and we love our Muslim friends. I know most of you in this room have Muslim friends. When you boil some of the core pieces of Islam down to what's the goal of the religion, 
Many will say, including Muslims, that Islam is a religion of duty. It's a religion of duty. You follow the five pillars of Islam. You say your prayers at the right times of the day. You follow the fasts and requirements of the religious holidays. You do your Muslim duty to be Muslim. And this is how eternity works according to the Quran. I'll, I'll show you on the screen here. This is from uh, Surah, I'm going to probably mispronounce this, I apologize. Surah al Minan, 23, 102 to 103. It says, then those whose scales are heavy, this is when you stand before God one day according to the Quran, it is they who will be, uh, those are heavy with good deeds, it's they who will be successful. But those whose scales are light, those are the ones who have lost their souls being in hell, abiding in eternity. I want to say this, because I, I don't want the spirit of this to be critical, because I appreciate how hardworking and kind and generous my Muslim neighbors are. They're some of my best neighbors and friends. But I imagine there's always a sense of, am I good enough for God? Is the scale heavy enough with my good deeds in heaven? Did I do enough? Did I work hard enough? Will my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds on that day of judgment? There's a hope of heaven for Muslims, but not a certainty in their belief system. In their belief system, there's a hope, but not a certainty. I'm not going to go through again everyone, but I'll, I'll look at just two more. The next two largest are Hinduism and Buddhism. 1.2 billion Hindus in the world, 520 million Buddhists in the world. And Hinduism and Buddhism, they are different religions, and there's key significant differences between them, so I don't want to just lump them together, although Buddhism did kind of come out of Hinduism way back in the day. But one similarity they both hold to is this idea of karma and reincarnation, with the end goal of liberation from this life, and either joining the divine in the case of Hinduism, or having nirvana, oneness, in the case of Buddhism. Here's the point. To get to those endpoints, it's a never-ending cycle of building up your karma, of reincarnation, of good deeds, of sacrifice in this life, so you can hopefully be in a better spot in the next life, the next time you get reincarnated. In Hinduism and Buddhism, the afterlife looks different than Christianity and Islam. But there's still this idea that you just have to work a bit harder. You just have to work harder and grind it out in this life for salvation. And maybe you'll get there. Be, do better. Be nicer. Be kinder. And the ideas of being a better human being ring true to every soul. I believe God's put that in our heart. Natural revelation. We all want to honor the goodness that God's put in our heart and soul. That's not the issue. It's great that people know deep down what they ought to do. But there is a hopelessness in thinking. Like, have I done enough in this life to get to a better spot next time around? Or maybe you go, you know what, I'm going to take, you know, I, I probably took two steps forward in the last two lives, so we're, this is going to be a one-step-back situation. You know, we're going to get there one day. I know I'm oversimplifying, and I apologize if I've offended or made it too simple. What I'm trying to do is cut to the heart and the nuances of all the major belief systems and faiths that people adhere to. And here's what makes Christianity so different. We have a hope for eternity that is not based on what we do. It isn't based on your human efforts. It isn't based on trying harder. It isn't based on how many good deeds you can accrue. There is no cosmic scale when you get to heaven that you'll step up to to see if you made it. There's no cycle of rebirth to attain a, some type of perfection. The hope we have is not based on human effort. It's based on Jesus' work on the cross, and that's it. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 says this, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him all those who've fallen asleep. It's through Jesus, not through our human effort. When Jesus, who was fully God and fully man, died, the Bible says he took on our sin. He took on all the sin of every human who's ever lived. He took on our wrongdoing. The scripture says he who knew no sin because he was God, fully God, fully man, became sin. There's this famous analogy of a judge. And uh, this judge in this kind of hypothetical country, he has to try uh, in a trial and the person who's on the stand, who's uh, done the sin and the, 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 the bad deeds of the trial, is his own son. 
And so this judge, he's known as a good judge, a righteous judge, a fair judge. And he goes through the trial and he comes to the end of the trial and he determines that, yes, my son, who I love, he's done the wrong things. He's committed the crimes. His sentence is prison. Sentence is, is, is it fits the crime. And so what does the judge do? The good and righteous judge, he gives the sentence that's deserved because he must. He's righteous. He's good. But he immediately steps off of the judge's stand and steps down to where the prison warden's about to put the handcuffs on and says, I'll take the punishment. I'll take the, I'll take the, the consequences. Put it on me. Obviously, in Canada, America, etc., this could never happen. This is hypothetical. But this is the picture of what God's done for us. This is the picture of grace. This is the picture of the hope we have. It doesn't matter how much wrong or sin or brokenness you've done, if you're truly repentant and you come to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive my sin, come into my heart, change my life. Like the good judge, God stepped out of heaven to take on our pain, to take on our shame, to rise again and offer us forgiveness. That's the gospel. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved. Grace means the unmerited favor of God. Through faith, this isn't your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one can boast. The hope that our salvation is based on, it's that it isn't our human effort that leads us to eternity. Jesus paid that price. All we're required to do is place our faith in Jesus, to ask him to come into our life, to forgive our sin and be our salvation. We have a hope that no one else has, completely different from any other belief system on planet Earth. Christ's second coming is your first hope. Let's keep reading. Uh, Verses 15 to 18 of chapter 4. Scripture says this, 15 to 18. I'm still lost. Okay, got it. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them, that's the dead who've risen, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words." Three encouraging truths about Jesus' second coming. The second one is this. We will go to be with Jesus forever. We'll go to be with Jesus forever. I want to be very careful in how I parse this section of Scripture because there's many reasonable interpretations of the Bible and of end times theology and Jesus' return and events that will happen in that day. The goal of my message isn't to give you a definitive interpretation of the end times. But here's what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians. The Bible says there's a day coming when Jesus will return to earth. He'll return at the end of history, at the end of human history, at the very least. It says those who are believers will be caught up in a cloud in his return and will go to be with the Lord for forever. Additionally, it says those who've passed away will rise and go to be with the Lord as well forever. And that's a good thing because we leave behind the brokenness of this world And we go to be with God forever in perfection. Now, this brings up some questions in the text that kind of start to get a bit hazy. And one obvious question you might be thinking as you're reading this and thinking about it is this. Does everyone who dies just kind of like chill in the grave until Jesus comes back? And like some of those folks might not look so great at this point, you know. Um, They might be really gone. I don't believe this is the case. And I'll explain why. First thing is this, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6 to 8, that when we are in our physical bodies, we're away from the Lord. One translation puts it like this, to be absent, though, from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I believe that when we die, we go to be in the presence of the Lord immediately. Some people have called this the intermediatory state after death, between our current earthly bodies and what will eventually be our glorified bodies. And I like to look at Jesus as our model. I think when you look at Jesus, you can kind of start to make sense of this. When Jesus died, his physical earthly body was placed in a tomb in the earthly realm. But in the spiritual realm, he was alive immediately. 
1 Peter 3, 18 to 19 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but what? Made alive in the Spirit, in which he went to proclaim to the spirits in prison. Here's the point from this verse. In the spiritual realm, Jesus was alive. And when we pass away from this life, our spirit will go to be with the Lord. But it doesn't stop there. The scripture tells us the ultimate goal for our spirit is to be in a glorified body. This might be news to some folks. You might have this vision of you just hanging out on a cloud with angel wings, eating, was it Philadelphia cream cheese? There was like an old commercial where, you know, the angels ate Philadelphia cream cheese for some reason. I don't know. Anyways, look it up. It's probably on YouTube. It doesn't stop there, though. <laughs> the scripture says this uh, um, about, about heaven. It says... Um, In Philippians 3, 20 to 21, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will what? Transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Here's the trajectory for Christ. When Jesus was put in the grave, he was in his, well, he wasn't in his earthly body. As soon as he died, his spirit was uh, left the earthly body. However, the spiritual self As soon as Jesus died, it was active in the spiritual realm. He went and preached to the spirits, the scripture says in 1 Peter. And when he rose again, he not only rose in an earthly physical body, but he rose again into a glorified physical body. Remember the disciples, they'd see Jesus appear and disappear, like he was weaving through dimensions or something like that. Yet at the same time, Jesus was physically touched by Thomas. He could feel the holes in his hands and the wounds in his side, although they didn't seem to be decaying his body. It's almost like they were permanent marks for us to remind us of what he did, but you could physically touch it. That was his glorified body. It was different than our earthly bodies, but physical and similar in the same time. Here's the point 1 Thessalonians and these other passages point to. When Jesus returns, it starts a transition where we as believers are given glorified bodies, just like Jesus, and we will live in a glorified physical earth. Although there's a phrase, new heaven and new earth, that's used in a few passages, the emphasis is that the earth will be renewed. It'll be restored to something like what God always intended it to be in Genesis chapter 1. In Revelation, when, we, when John sees the new heaven and the new earth, Jesus says, behold, I'm making all things new. The emphasis isn't brand new, it's making, it's returning it to the state in which it was supposed to be. In Romans 8, we're told that creation is literally groaning and longing to be set free from the bondage of sin and brokenness and obtain a glorification that we will receive when we receive our glorified bodies. I wanted to take some time to speak about this stuff because I think the afterlife is one of the most hazy things when it comes to our faith that we kind of just dodge sometimes. And it's good to look at the scriptures and it's good to understand what's actually going on here. But here's the key thing. Sin separates us from God in this physical existence. In the next glorified physical existence, there will be no sin and there will be no separation from God. We will be with the Lord always. And that's a good thing. It's exciting. Imagine the life you would live if you knew no pain, no sin, no suffering. You had eternal days to explore God's creation, and you were surrounded by the physical presence of God at all times. I think that's so cool. Like everything that you'd ever hope to do. Like when, remember I was talking about those little trivial hopes that we go after? In eternity, you will have eternity to chase every trivial hope that you've ever wanted to go after. That's cool. I'm excited. Maybe I'll be an astronaut. I don't know. It'll be cool. Christ's second coming is your first hope. We'll be, and we'll get to be with Jesus forever. All right, here's the last part of the passage today. It's the beginning of uh, chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 1 to 11 very quickly here. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, You have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. 
For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not the night, um, the night or the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. Here's the third encouraging truth about Jesus' second coming. We're going to wrap things up pretty quickly here. We live expecting the imminent return of Christ. We live expecting the imminent return of Christ. When will Jesus return? Do you know? People have been trying to project Jesus' return, predict Jesus' return, I should say, since the time of Paul. Every generation thinks that they're in the worst times, in the last generation, and it must be any moment now. Every generation often thinks they're the best too. My daughter, uh, Georgia, the other day, she was saying, man, it'll be sad when my class finishes grade eight because we were the best class. <laughs> and I'm like, I feel like every class since the first grade eight class ever probably thought, you know, no one could be as great as them, right? But anyways, we always seem to think that it centers around us is the point I'm getting at, okay? But Jesus tells us in the Gospels, no one knows the hour of my return. So we live expecting Jesus' imminent return, even if it hasn't happened in 2,000 years. It'll happen one day. It's kind of like this. When Wendy and I got married, I learned something very quickly about my wife. It was my job and role, and it was an expectation she had that every night I check all the doors and windows of the house to make sure they are locked and secure just in case someone tries to invade our house. So every night, Wendy will say to me, did you lock the back door? Did you lock the front door? Did you check all the windows? And it's so hard because I'm, I'm, I try and be an honest person, and if I didn't think to look at it, I can't lie to her. I can't say like, yeah, yeah, I checked it, I checked it. So I'm there trudging back downstairs, <laughs> checking all the stuff and whatever. In our house, we live with an imminent expectation that someone's going to come break into our home. I know, maybe that's sick. I don't know, that's weird. Okay. Now I know, and I know Wendy knows, that the odds of a home invasion are very, 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 very slim. It's slim to none. But we just decided, let's take precautions to live in such a way that should that day ever come, we were prepared. And in this case, the thief couldn't get in. In this passage here, it says, Jesus will come like a thief in the night. And hopefully you haven't locked all the windows and stuff. In this case, you want him to come, okay? It might not be this night. It might not be the next night. But one day, be that 10 years, 150 years, 1,000 years, Jesus will return. And the question is, will you be ready? Will you be ready if it's in your lifetime? Over the course of my life, I've met a number of people who've been like, hey, I want to become a Christian. It sounds good and stuff, but that's going to be one day when I'm older. I'll make a faith commitment then because right now I've got my own things. I've got my own agenda. I've got my own stuff, my own little hopes to accomplish, essentially. It's kind of like I'm just going to leave all the doors unlocked and the windows open because it's pretty unlikely a thief will ever show up at night. Like that's almost no chance. And you know, in Milton, the odds of a thief showing up at night are pretty slim. It won't happen until one day it does. That's why you lock your doors. That's why you lock your windows. That's why you live your life prepared. And when it comes to the imminent return of Jesus, we need to live our lives like he could return any day now. Paul says, you're not living in darkness. You're not living without hope. He says, you are children of light. He says, don't be asleep like everyone else. He says, don't live like everybody else lives, but be awake, be sober. It's a metaphor. Don't make all these other hopes, these little things in life, the main thing. They're nice, but they're inconsequential. I love this. Paul says, let these things mark your life. What? He says, a faith in God, a love in all you do, and the hope of your salvation. Don't get caught off guard. Live like Jesus is coming today. I want to invite our worship team up as we close out the message here. We started this morning saying this, Christ's second coming is your first hope. And you might be hearing this message today, this sermon, and maybe it's like hitting you for the first time, this hope that you can have in Jesus. 
Maybe you've come from another faith tradition or a belief system, you know, agnostic or atheistic or whatever, and you maybe felt like you've had to work to earn your salvation. You had to do good deeds to make it to the next life. Maybe for the first time today, just this contrast of the Christian faith is really clear. You don't have to earn your salvation. It's not about what you do. It's a free gift of God. All you have to do is place your faith in Jesus. If that's you, I just want to encourage you to take a moment today and make a faith commitment to Christ. Pray. It's simple. It's just a simple prayer. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive my sin. I want to place my hope in you for salvation, for eternity. Don't delay that decision. Jesus might not be back for hundreds of years, but he might be coming tomorrow. And if you're ready to find true hope and peace in your life, make that faith commitment to Jesus today. And for those of us who are Christians already, I want you to notice that 4 verse 18 and 5 verse 11, there's a phrase that comes up twice. Encourage one another. Encourage one another. Encourage one another. With these words, build each other up. Who are some people you could be encouraging in their faith this week? Is it your spouse? Is it your kids? Is it your parents? Is it your siblings? Is it your friends? Who could you be reminding, like, Jesus is coming. This is exciting news. It's great. It's awesome. How can we live our lives with the thought and the hope of the imminent return of Jesus? We have a hope that no one else on planet Earth has. In every other belief system, every other worldview, there's uncertainty. With Christ, there's no uncertainty. You can have certainty in your salvation today. Christ's second coming is your first hope. Allow me to pray for us. Lord, I thank you, God, that uh, you're a good God. We thank you, God, that um, you're a God of grace, a God of unmerited favor. Lord, that there's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation with you, God. You did it all. You paid the price on the cross, Jesus. You bore our sin. Lord, for those of us who've been living for you, who've made faith decisions, God, may we continue to live in light of those faith decisions. It's not an excuse for sin, but maybe we'd be inspired to live like you live, Jesus. May we seek, starting from a place of grace, to live in the place of holiness as we looked at in previous weeks. May we live for you. For those, God, who haven't had a chance to follow you, Lord, may this be the day today that one person here would say, Jesus, I confess my sin to you. Come into my life. Forgive me. Be my Lord and Savior. May this be the day of salvation, the day of hope for someone in this room. We love you and we thank you, God, for your goodness to us. We thank you, Jesus, that you're coming again. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, worship. Um... As always, everything kind of folds together quite nicely. And I said to Pastor Mark, why am I always so amazed? But thank you, God, for being in this room today and just weaving everything together. Uh, Just as we close, I just want to make um, you aware of our prayer teams that are to my right and to my left. And, you know, if there's, uh, you know, if you're missing that hope that we all have, you're missing that hope and you want to pray with our prayer teams, they're there with you. Um, they're also there just to, um, yeah, they, they'll pray over you, pray over you um, in an amazing way. So just be, um, just let you go on your day just thinking about that hope that we have um, that we could just cling to. And we're just, uh, just amazed. But thank you, God. Anyways, you're dismissed. Have an awesome Sunday.